Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's regular Friday program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I will be your reader today. At Bowdoin College, today's author in the spotlight wrote in his journal upon graduation in 1825, quote, I was an idle student, negligent of college rules and the procrustean details of conformity in academic life, rather choosing to nurse my own fancies than to dig into Greek roots and be numbered among the learned Thebans. <laughs> Born in Salem, Massachusetts, Nathaniel Hawthorne became a Maine boy from away at age 14 when his family moved to the village of Raymond, a mere 90 miles to the southwest from where I share today's story. Returning to Salem at the conclusion of his Bowdoin days, he wrote 11 years later in 1836, Quote, in this dismal and squalid chamber, fame was won, end quote, referring to his room under the eaves. <laughs> it was indeed in that same year, he was appointed editor of the American magazine of useful and entertaining knowledge. Hmm. His first regular employment, and he moved to Boston to assume his duties, and of course, to be even closer to the very vibrant publishing world in Boston at the time. Hawthorne's first taste of success came slowly, but finally, with his sketches and short stories gathered in his collection, The Storyteller. Five years later, in 1841, he joined the utopian community of Brook Farm in West Roxbury, Massachusetts, but left after only eight months, convinced that he, quote, can best attain the higher ends of his life by retaining the ordinary relations to society, end quote. A story to be told there, of course. One year later, in 1842, he married Sophia Peabody and rented the old manse in Concord, the ancestral property of the Ralph Waldo Emerson family. Acquaintances in the transcendentalist circle included Emerson as well as Henry David Thoreau, among uh, several other people. A reluctant return to Salem in 1847 eventually brought his first cause for celebration, the publication of The Scarlet Letter in 1850. Hawthorne, quote, bids farewell forever to this abominable city. The book is now hailed, of course, as Hawthorne's greatest literary achievement. Success led him to Lennox in the Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts and the intellectual summer colony of Bowdoin classmates, Henry Longfellow, along with James Russell Lowell, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and subsequently, Herman Melville. With Melville, Hawthorne established a brief, though profound, mental communion, as indicated at least by Melville's letters to him. His own side of the correspondence is not survived. Melville wrote, quote, I shall leave the world, I feel, with more satisfaction for having come to know you 
very flattering indeed. And it was to Nathaniel Hawthorne that Herman Melville dedicated his book, Moby Dick, with this note, quote, in token of my admiration for his genius, this book is inscribed to Nathaniel Hawthorne. The House of the Seven Gables cemented Hawthorne's literary legacy in 1851, as did his third edition of the ever-popular Twice Told Tales, with 17 previously uncollected short stories. One year later, in 1852, our great New England writer penned The Blythdale Romance, the first of four novels he himself called romances, quote, unrealistic stories in exotic settings. Near the end of that decade, a little technical split there, <laughs> at the end of that decade of the 1850s, the Hawthorns traveled to France, then by sea to Italy, and significantly to Rome from January to May, and back again in the fall. Significantly because today's novel unfolds in the great city of Rome. Hawthorne was fascinated by what he saw as the, quote, great decay of Rome, keeping notebook records of observations of scenes and persons, particularly of the expatriate community. Sculptor William Wetmore's story, William Cullen Bryant, and Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Hawthorne's vivid experiences in Rome gave birth finally in 1860 to the fourth and last of his romances, indeed the last of his finished novels, The Marble Fawn, today's book in the spotlight. Millicent Bell, former professor of English at Boston University and 1983 editor of the second volume of Hawthorne's works, writes, quote, Hawthorne is even more appreciated in our time than he was in his own, and his inexhaustibly suggestive style will strike many readers as remarkably contemporary." End of quote. Nathaniel Hawthorne's works do belong to Romanticism, or more specifically, dark Romanticism. Cautionary tales that suggest that guilt and sin and evil are the most inherent natural qualities of humanity. A Puritan indeed. His depictions of the past are a version of historical fiction used only as a vehicle to express common themes of ancestral sin, guilt, and retribution. Nathaniel Hawthorne one of America's greatest mid-19th century authors, was coincidentally born on Independence Day, July 4th, 1804. And now to the marble fawn. The central metaphor of the marble fawn is indeed a sculpture of a fawn a half-human and half-goat mythological creature appearing in Greek and Roman mythology. The fawn was a sculpture that Hawthorne had first seen in Rome. The sculptor was Praxiteles of Athens, the most renowned of the Greek sculptors of the fourth century BCE. When Donatello, oh, another glitch here, we're skipping around too much today here. <laughs> In 
The fawn of Hawthorne's novel is a man by the name of Donatello, a passionate young Italian who makes the acquaintance of three artists who are spending time in Rome. Kenyon and Hilda, who are both from the United States, are uh, joined by Miriam, according to the novel's narrator, quote, was plucked up out of a mystery and has its roots still clinging to her. We know not where she is from, although the implication is European. When Donatello kills a man who has been shadowing Miriam, he is wrapped by guilt until he is arrested by the police and imprisoned. Donatello's resemblance to the sculptured fawn is typical of his spirit, unawakened and looking neither before nor after until his crime puts an end forever to his joyous holiday existence and remorse for it develops his intellect and his soul. Kenyon is a good type of a cultivated American, quietly enthusiastic, tolerant, not cynical, loving art, and not despising America. Hilda is remarkable for the great moral strength united with her delicacy and her sensibility. She is often referred to in the book as a good New England girl. Her suffering as a result of the crime of which she has been merely a witness is strongly contrasted with the attitude of Miriam, whose conscience needs to be brought to a full awakening even after participating in it. Her free and strong nature, having been bewildered in a maze of wrong, the one escape from which has offered itself in sudden temptation. In my humble opinion, however more contemporary in style than are all of Hawthorne's earlier works, the slow and deliberate wordsmithing of the vast majority of his books and all mid 19th century literary works rings true indeed in the marble fawn. As when reading the works of other authors of the period, I settled into the reading of Hawthorne's final and longest novel. Although mostly set in Rome and later a bit in Tuscany, only one of the four characters, though, is Italian. That's rather important to the story, and that is our man Donatello. Miriam's origin, as I mentioned earlier, remains a mystery, and it's vague as to why Hawthorne keeps it a mystery throughout the play. Uh, throughout the book, <laughs> even though she does depart from Rome at one point, we don't know where she's gone. Bit of a mystery there. The remaining two characters are the New Englanders, and Hawthorne often reminds us of the fact that the Rome of an expatriate with an extensive knowledge, but a very, very dim view of the city in decay, what I would like to do is to set that stage for Hawthorne's visual of Rome as we are in 1860, which I think is quite amazing and certainly not the description and the depiction we might consider today, as we know. Um, it's really quite fascinating that he uh, is so um, anti-Rome, <laughs> if I may speak about that. Um, he just is not at all keen on the, on the city of Rome. Let's see now. I have lost my post-it on that. How can that possibly be? 
Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to insert things then as we go along. As I read from the beginning of the book, you will get the very strong sense, indeed, um, that he is not very fond of Rome. I am going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to circle back toward the end uh, to um, the uh, visual of uh, the uh, man lost. Does it require drama in someone's life, bad, in order to achieve goodness? Hmm. That's uh, falls quite uh, uh, perhaps in a puritanical way there, but uh, I'm going to quote a couple of paragraphs uh, from later in the book. Let me begin at the beginning. The first chapter is called, um, rightly enough, Miriam, Hilda, Kenyon, and Donatello. Four individuals in whose fortunes we should be glad to interest the reader happened to be standing in one of the salons of the sculpture gallery in the capital at Rome. It was that room, the first, after ascending the staircase, in the center of which reclines the noble and most pathetic figure of the dying gladiator, just sinking into his death swoon. Around the walls stand the Antonis, the Amazon, the Lycian Apollo, and the Juno, all famous productions of antique sculpture and still shining in the undiminished majesty and beauty of their ideal life. Although the marble that embodies them is yellow with time and perhaps corroded by the damp earth in which they lay buried for centuries. Here, Likewise is seen a symbol, as apt at this moment as it was 2,000 years ago, of the human soul, with its choice of innocence or evil close at hand, in the pretty figure of a child clasping a dove to her bosom, but assaulted by a snake. From one of the windows of this salon, we may see a flight of broad stone steps descending alongside the antique and massive foundation of the capital towards the battered triumphal arc of Septimius Severus, right below it. Farther on, the eye skirts along the edge of the desolate forum, where Roman washerwomen now hang out their linen to the sun. Passing over a shapeless confusion of modern edifices piled rudely up with ancient brick and stone, and over the domes of Christian churches built on the old pavements of heathen temples, and supported by the very pillars that once upheld them. At a distance beyond, yet but a little way, considering how much history is heaped into the intervening space, rises the great sweep of the Colosseum, with the blue sky brightening through its upper tier of arches. Far off, the view is shut in by the Alban Mountains, looking just the same amid all their decay and change as when Romulus gazed thitherward over his half-finished wall. We glance hastily at these things, at this bright sky and those blue distant mountains, and at the ruins, Etruscan, Roman, Christian, venerable with a threefold antiquity, and at the company of world famous statues in the Salon, in the hope of putting the reader into that state of feeling which is experienced oftenest in Rome. It is a vague sense of ponderous remembrances, a perception of such weight and density in a bygone life, of which this spot was the center, that the present moment is pressed down or crowded out, and our individual affairs and interests are about half as real here as elsewhere. Viewed through this medium, our narrative into which are woven some airy and unsubstantiated threads 
intermixed with others twisted out of the commonest stuff of human existence, may seem not widely different from the texture of all of our lives. Side by side with the massiveness of the Roman past, all matters that we handle or dream of nowadays look evanescent and visionary alike. It might be that the four persons whom we are seeking to introduce were conscious of this dreamy character of the present as compared with the square blocks of granite wherewith the Romans built their lives. Perhaps it even contributed to the fanciful merriment which was just now their mood. When we find ourselves fading into shadows and unreality, it seems hardly worthwhile to be sad but rather to laugh as gaily as we may and ask little reason wherefore. Of these four friends of ours, three were artists or connected with art. And at this moment, they had been simultaneously struck by a resemblance between one of the antique statues a well-known masterpiece of Grecian sculpture, and a young Italian, the fourth member of their party, Donatello. You must needs confess, Kenyon, said a dark-eyed young woman whom her friends call Marion, that you never chiseled out of marble nor wrought in clay a more vivid likeness than this, cunning a bust maker as you think yourself. The portraiture is perfect in character and sentiment and feature. If it were a picture, the resemblance might be half elusive and half imaginary. But here, in this pantelic marble, it is a substantial fact and may be tested by absolute touch and measurement. Our friend Donatello is the very Fawn of Proxiteles. It is not true, Hilda? Mm, not quite. Uh, um, almost. Yes, yes, I, I really think so, replied Hilda, a slender, brown-haired New England girl whose perceptions of form and expression were wonderfully clear and delicate. If there is any difference between the two faces, the reason may be, I suppose, that the fawn dwelt in woods and fields and consorted with his like, whereas Donatello has known cities a little and such people as ourselves. But the resemblance is very close, <laughs> very strange. Not so strange, whispered Marian mischievously. For no fawn in Arcadia was even a greater simpleton than Donatello. He has hardly a man's share of wit, small as that may be. It is a pity there are no longer any of this congenial race of rustic creatures for our friend to consort with. Hush, naughty one, returned Hilda. You are very ungrateful, for you well know he has wit enough to worship you at all events. Then the greater fool he, <laughs> said Miriam, so bitterly and wistfully that Hilda's quiet eyes were somewhat startled. Donatello, my dear friend, said Kenyon in Italian, pray gratify all of us by taking the exact attitude of this statue. The young man laughed and threw himself into the position in which the statue had been standing for two or three thousand years. In truth, allowing for the difference of costume, and if a lion's skin could have been substituted for his modern talma and a rustic pipe for his stick, Donatello might have figured perfectly as the marble form, miraculously softened into flesh and blood. Yes, the resemblance is wonderful, observed Kenyon, after examining the marble and the man with the accuracy of a sculptor's eye. There is one point, however, or rather two points, 
in respect to which our friend Donatello's abundant curls will not permit us to say whether the likeness is carried into minute detail. And the sculptor directed the attention of the party to the ears of the beautiful statue which they were contemplating. But we must do more than merely refer to this exquisite work of art. It must be described, however inadequate may be the effort to express its magic peculiarity in words. The fawn is the marble image of a young man leaning his right arm on the trunk or stump of a tree. One hand hangs carelessly by his side. In the other, he holds the fragment of a pipe or some such sylvan instrument of music. His only garment, a lion skin, with the claw upon his shoulder, falls halfway down his back, having leaving the limbs and entire front of the figure nude. The form, thus displayed, is marvelously graceful, but has a fuller and more rounded outline, more flesh and less of heroic muscle than the old sculptures were wont to assign to their types of masculine beauty. The character of the face corresponds with the figure. It is most agreeable in outline and feature, but rounded and somewhat voluptuously developed, especially about the throat and the chin. The nose is almost straight, but very slightly curves inward, thereby acquiring an indescribable charm of geniality and humor. The mouth, with its full yet delicate lips, seems to nearly to smile outright, but it calls forth a responsive smile. The whole statue, unlike anything else that ever was wrought in that severe material of marble, conveys the idea of an amiable and sensual creature, easy, mirthful, apt for jollity, yet not incapable of being touched by pathos. It is impossible to gaze long at this stone image without conceiving a kindly sentiment towards it, as if its substance were warm to the touch and imbued with actual life. It comes very close to some of our pleasantest sympathies. Perhaps it is the very lack of moral severity of any high and heroic ingredient in the character of the fawn that makes it so delightful an object to the human eye and to the frailty of the human heart. The being here represented is endowed with no principle of virtue and would be incapable of comprehending such. But he would be true and honest by dint of his simplicity. We would expect from him no sacrifice, nor effort for an abstract cause. There is not an atom of martyr's stuff in all that softened marble, but he has a capacity for strong and warm attachment and might act devotedly through its impulse and even die for it if need. It is possible, too, that the fawn might be educated through the medium of his emotions, so that the coarser animal portion of his nature might eventually be thrown into the background, though never utterly expelled. The animal nature, indeed, is the most essential part of the fawn's composition. For the characteristics of the brute creation, meet, and combine with those of humanity. In this strange yet true and natural conception of antique poetry and art, Persictiles has subtly diffused throughout his work that mute mystery which so hopelessly perplexes us whenever we attempt to gain an intellectual or sympathetic knowledge of the lower orders of creation. The riddle is indicated, however, only by two definite signs. These are the two ears of the fawn, which are leaf-shaped, terminating in little peaks like those of some species of animals. 
though not so seen in the marble, they are probably to be considered as clothed in fine downy fur. In the coarser representations of this class of mythological creatures, there's another token of brute kindred, a certain <clears throat> caudal appendage, which if the fawn of Praxiteles must be supposed to possess it at all, is hidden by the lion's skin that forms his garment. The pointed and furry ears, therefore, are the sole indications of this wild forest nature. Only a sculpture, sculptor of the finest imagination, the most delicate taste, the sweetest feeling, and the rarest artistic skill, in a word, a sculptor and a poet too, could have first dreamed of a fawn in this guise and then have succeeded in imprisoning the sportive and frisky thing in marble. Neither man nor animal, and yet no monster, but a being in whom both races meet on friendly ground. The idea grows coarse as we handle it and hardens in our grasp, but if the spectator broods long over the statue, he will be conscious of its spell all the pleasantness of sylvan life, all the genial and happy characteristics of creatures that dwell in woods and fields will seem to be mingled and kneaded into one substance, along with the kindred qualities in the human soul. Trees, grass, flowers, woodland streamlets, cattle, deer, and unsophisticated man. The essence of all of these was compressed long ago and still exists within the discolored marble surface of the fauna of Praxiteles. <clears throat> Excuse me. And after all, the idea may have been no dream, but rather a poet's reminiscent of a period when man's affinity with nature was more strict and his fellowship with every living thing more intimate and dear. The next chapter is called The Fawn, which is obviously appropriate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Donatello, playfully cried Miriam, do not leave us in this perplexity. Shake aside those brown curls, my friend, and let us see whether this marvelous resemblance extends to the very tips of the ears. If so, we shall like you all the better. No, 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 dear signorina, answered Donatello laughing, but with a certain earnestness. I entreat you to take the tips of my ears for granted. <clears throat> As he spoke, the young Italian made a skip and a jump, light enough for a veritable fawn, so as to place himself quite beyond the reach of the fair hand that was outstretched, as if to settle the matter by actual examination. I shall be like a wolf of the Apennines, he continued, taking his stand on the other side of the dying gladiator. If you touch my ears ever so softly, none of my race could endure it. It has always been a tender point with my forefathers and me. He spoke in Italian with the Tuscan rusticity of accent and an unshaped sort of utterance, betokening that he must heretofore have been chiefly conversant with rural people. Well, well, said Marion, your tender point, your two tender points, if you have them, shall be saved as far as I'm concerned. But how strange this likeness is, after all, and how delightful it is really includes the pointed ears. No, oh, it is impossible, of course, she continued in English, with a real and commonplace young man like Donatello, but you see how this peculiarity defines the position of the fawn, and while putting him where he cannot exactly assert his brotherhood, still disposes us kindly towards the kindred creature. He is not supernatural, but just on the verge of nature, and yet within it. What is the nameless charm of this idea, Hilda? Can you feel it more delicately than I? Well, it perplexes me, said Hilda, thoughtfully and shrinking a little. 
neither do I quite like to think about it. But surely, said Kenyon, you agree with Miriam and me that there is something very touching and impressive in this statue of the fawn. In some long past age, he must really have existed. Nature needed and still needs this beautiful creature, standing betwixt man and animal, sympathizing with each, comprehending the speech of either race, and interpreting the whole existence of one to the other. What a pity that he has forever vanished from the hard and dusty paths of life, unless, added the sculptor in a sportive whisper, Donatella be actually he. You cannot conceive how this fantasy takes hold of me, explained Miriam, between jest and earnest. Imagine now a real being similar to this mythic fawn. How happy, how genial, how satisfactory would be his life enjoying the warm, sensuous, earthy side of nature, reveling in the merriment of woods and streams, living as our four-footed kindred do, as mankind did in its innocent childhood, before sin, sorrow, or, or morality itself had even been thought of. Ah, Kenyon, if Hilda and you and I, if I at least, had pointed ears, for I suppose the fawn had no conscience, no remorse, no burthen on the heart, no troublesome recollections of any sort, no dark future either. What a tragic tone was this last Miriam, said the sculptor, and looking into her face, he was startled to behold it pale and tear-stained. How suddenly this mood has come over you. Let us go on as it came, said Miriam, like a thunder shower in this Roman sky. All the sunshine again now, you see. Donna Tello's refractoriness is regarded his ears had evidently cost him something. And he now came close to Miriam's side, gazing at her with an appealing air as if to solicit forgiveness. His mute, helpless gesture of entreaty had something pathetic in it, and yet might well enough excite a laugh, so like it was to what you may see in the aspect of a hound when he thinks himself in fault or disgrace. It was difficult to make out the character of this young man, so full of animal life as he was, so joyous in his deportment, so handsome, so physically well-developed. He made no impression of incompleteness, of maimed or stinted nature. And yet, in social intercourse, these familiar friends of his habitually and instinctively allowed for him as for a child or some other lawless thing, exacting no strict obedience to conventional rules, and hardly noticing his story, his eccentricities enough to pardon them. There was an indefinable characteristic about Donatello that set him outside of rules. He caught Miriam's hand, kissed it, and gazed into her eyes without saying a word. She smiled and bestowed on him a little careless caress, singularly like what one would give to a pet dog when he puts himself in the way to receive it. Not that it was so decided a caress, neither, but only the merest touch, somewhere between a pat and a tap of the finger. It might be a mark of fondness, or perhaps a playful pretense of punishment. At all events, it appeared to afford Donatello exquisite pleasure, insomuch that he danced quite round the wooden railing that fences in the dying gladiator. It is the very step of the dancing fawn, said Miriam apart to Hilda. What a child. <laughs> what a simpleton he is. I continually find myself treating Donatello as if he were the merest unfledged chicken. And yet, he can claim no such privileges in the right of his tender age, for he is at least, uh, how old should you think, Hilda? Twenty years, perhaps, replied Hilda, glancing at Donatello, but indeed I, I cannot tell. 
hardly so odd on second thoughts or, or possibly older. He has nothing to do with time, but has a look of eventual youth in his face. All underwitted people have that look, said Marion, scornfully. Donatello has certainly the gift of eternal youth, as Hilda suggests, observed Kenyon, laughing, for judging by the date of this statue, which I am more and more convinced Praxiteles carved on purpose for him, he must be at least 25 centuries old, and he still looks as young as ever. What age have you, Donatello? asked Miriam. Signorina, I do not know, he answered. No great age, however, for I have only lived since I met you. Now, what old man of society could have turned a silly compliment more smartly than that, exclaimed Miriam. Nature and art are just at one sometimes. But what a happy ignorance is this of our friend Donatello, not to know his own age. It is equivalent to being immortal on earth. If I could only forget mine. It is too soon to wish that, observed the sculptor. You are scarcely older than Donatello looks. I should be content then, rejoined Miriam, if I could only forget one day of all my life. Then she seemed to repent of this illusion and hastily added, a woman's days are so tedious that it is a boon to leave even one of them out of the account. The foregoing conversation had been carried on in a mood in which all imaginative people, whether artists or poets, love to indulge. In this frame of mind, they sometimes find their profoundest truth side by side with the idlest jest and other one or the other, apparently without distinguishing which is the most valuable or assigning any considerable value to either. The resemblances between the marble fawn and their living companion had made a deep, half serious, half mirthful impression on these three friends and had taken them into a certain airy region, lifting up, as it is so pleasant to feel them lifted, their heavy, earthly feet from the actual soil of life. The world had been set afloat, as it were, for a moment, and relieved them for just so long of all customary responsibility for what they thought and said. It must be under this influence, or perhaps because sculptors always amuse one another's works, that Kenyon threw in a criticism upon the dying gladiator. I used to admire this statue exceedingly, he remarked, but laterally, I find myself getting weary and annoyed that the man should be such a length of time leaning on his arm in the very act of death. If he is so terribly hurt, why does he not sink down and die without further ado? Flitting moments, imminent emergencies, Imperceptible intervals between two breaths ought not to be entrusted to the eternal repose of marble. In any sculptural subject, there should be a moral standstill, since there must be necessity of a physical. Otherwise, it is like flinging a block of marble up into the air and by some trick or enchantment, causing it to stick there. You feel that it ought to come down and are dissatisfied that it does not obey the natural law. I see, said Miriam, mischievously. You think that sculpture should be a sort of fossilizing process? But in truth, your frozen art has nothing like the scope and freedom of Hilda's and mine. In painting, there is no similar objection to the representation of brief statues of time. Perhaps because a story can be so much more fully told in picture and buttressed about with circumstances that give it an epoch. For instance, a painter never would have sent down yonder fawn out of his fair antiquity, lonely and desolate, with no companion to keep the simple heart warm. Ah, the fawn, cried Hilda with a little gesture of impatience. I've been looking at him too long. And now, 
Instead of a beautiful statue, immortally young, I see only a corroded and discolored stone. This change is very apt to occur in statues. And a similar one in pictures, surely, retorted the sculptor. It is the spectator's mood that transfigures the transconfiguration itself. I defy any painter to move and elevate me without my own consent and assistance. Then you are deficient of a sense, cried Mariel. The party now strayed onward from hall to hall of that rich gallery, pausing here and there to look at the multitude of noble and lovely shapes which have been dug up out of the deep grave in which old Rome lies buried. And still, the realization of the antique form in the person of Donatello gave a more vivid character to all these marble ghosts. Why should not each marble statue grow warm with life? Antinous might lift his brow and tell us why he is forever sad. The Lycian Apollo might strike his leer. And at the first vibration, that other fawn in red marble, who keeps up a motionless stance, should frisk gaily forth, leading yonder satyrs with shaggy goat shanks to clatter their little hoops upon the floor and all join hands with Donatello. Bacchus, too, a rosy flush diffusing itself over his time-stained surface, would come down from his pedestal and offer a cluster of purple grapes to Donatello's lips, because the god recognizes him as the woodland elf who so often shared his revels. And here, on this sarcophagus, the exquisitely carved figures might assume life, and chase one another round its verge with that wild merriment which is so strangely represented on those old buried coffers. Though still, with some subtle allusion to death, carefully veiled, but forever peeping forth amid emblems of mirth and rot. As the four friends descended the stairs, however, their play of fancy subsided into a much more somber mood a result apt to follow upon such exhilaration as that which had so recently taken possession of them. Do you know, said Miriam confidentially to Hilda, I doubt the reality of this likeness to Donatello to the fall, which we have been talking so much about. To say the truth, it never struck me so forcibly as it did Kenyon and yourself, though I gave in whatever you were pleased to fancy, but for the sake for a moment's mirth and wonder, well, I was certainly in modest, in earnest, as you seemed equally so, replied Hilda, glancing back at Donatello, as if to reassure herself of the resemblance. But faces change so much from hour to hour that the same set of features that offer no keeping with oneself, to an eye at least, which looks at expression more than outline. How sad and somber he has grown all of a sudden. Angry, too, methinks. Nay. It is his anger much more than sadness, said Miriam. I've seen Donatello in this mood once or twice before. If you consider him well, you will observe an odd mixture of the bulldog or some other equally fierce brute in our friend's composition, a trait of savageness hardly to be expected in such a gentle creature as he usually is. Donatello is a very strange young man. I wish you would not haunt my footsteps so continually. You have bewitched the young man and poor lad, said the sculptor laughing. You have a faculty of bewitching people and is providing you with a singular train of followers. I see another of them behind yonder pillar and it is his presence that has aroused Donatello's wrath. I'm going to end the chapter there. There are some key words and key reactions that play out throughout the book. Uh, wrath is one of them, and anger is another one of those words. And also this mysterious moment where Marion is recalling a single day from the past, which she would like to erase from her diary, as it were. Uh, so there is, um, uh, he's, placing a lot of little red flags at this point in time. 
as the novel goes on, uh, it is become, it becomes more and more of a mystery novel, as a matter of fact. Um, a first mystery being who the source of Marion, from whence came she and how is she in the spook. Um, and there is somebody following her all the time, um, who we find out later is a monk. But that story is obviously tied to this moment in chapter two. Um, and then the wrath and anger, certainly the anger piece, comes out very, very strongly three fourths of the way through the book uh, when the smiling and friendly, jovial Donatello, the marble fawn, makes a sudden decision, sudden decision uh, with Mary and beside him uh, to throw, literally push, this mysterious monk over the cliff to his death. And that is all observed by Hilda. So even though the sculptor in our group knows nothing of this, of the three of them continue on the story with the sculptor coming in and out, but it is the three of them and the effect of that single moment that connects to Miriam, then of course connects in a moment of anger to Donatello. And then this enormous, enormous feelings that Hilda has of having observed and not reported what has gone on. So the book becomes very much a mystery novel in many ways. It, of course, is a novel of romance as well. Um, and we do find out later that the sculptor and Hilda have a, a connection that develops as the book goes on. So there is romance there. But there is also mythology, um, and there is also magic. Uh, and because Hawthorne's knowledge of Roe, particularly, um, is so uh, detailed uh, in that period that he spent in Rome, you can walk with him. <laughs> if you know Rome, you know that everything he's taking you on, you see. Um, so it's very, very detailed, turn left, turn right, kind of thing. So it's also a bit of a travelogue. I think it's his best book, actually. I stick my neck out and say that, of course, after the two great books that uh, people usually put at the top of the list. But I consider this, the longest and the last, far more intriguing and far more detailed um, and far more interesting, the puzzle pieces are smaller. And so, as you know, to make a thousand piece puzzle, you must be much more careful than a 500 piece puzzle, using that simple comparison uh, to note that I find this book to be as fine as it is. So, I give it high recommendations, and I hope you might read it. You perhaps have read the first two books. Most of us read at least one of them in high school. So. <laughs> but if you've not read the Marvel form, I very, very strongly recommend it. I wanted to close, though, with a couple of paragraphs just uh, to bring up this subject of uh, the, diet, the falling man or the fall of man. These are two, uh, uh, not connected, two different sections of the book, but um, this first one says, um, one might conclude that sin which man chose instead of good, has been so beneficently handled by omniscience and omnip omnipotence that whereas our dark enemy sought to destroy us by it, it has really become an instrument most effective in the education of intellect and soul. The condition of man now could only come about after the fall of man. And the other one, which comes much later, actually, um, and it is this. Um, let's make sure I do find the right one. In, uh, is sin, then, which we deem such a dreadful blackness in the universe, is it, like sorrow, merely an element of human education through which we struggle to a higher and purer state than we could otherwise have attained. Did Adam fall that we might 
ultimately rise to a far loftier paradise than is. Of course, this is, uh, is echoing uh, sentiments of time. Uh, I mentioned, of course, that he connected with transcendentalism for a bit of time, or Thoreau, of course, is the name one frequently connects, and was a friend of uh, Hawthorne's. Um, and also the utopian communities, etc. So he was really scouring about to connect and chose neither. But these two definitely echo the period, uh, parts of the period of the time. So I'm glad I remembered to tell you that. I hope you uh, were tantalized by it. You might read the entire book. It is 400 pages, and one goes slow to pick up those tiny puzzle pieces. Take my advice. I'd like to take just a second to uh, talk a little bit about next week's book. In this month of July, I have selected four books uh, that focus on the single word choice. Um, the first book of the month was uh, the choice to be a hermit for four decades uh, in the uh, locks of, of Scotland. Very excellent book. Uh, this one obviously was a choice, however sudden, that Donatello made to uh, murder the skulking monk in the background. And what has happened, what happens as the result of that instant choice, that impulsive choice. The next one is also about choice, connects more to the first one of the month. It's a book that was published in 2021. Uh, the book was written by Elizabeth Letts. Uh, perhaps you've already read it, The Ride of Her Life, it is called. Uh, it was a national bestseller, the triumphant true story of a woman who rode her horse across America in the 1950s, fulfilling her dying wish to see the Pacific Ocean. From the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Perfect Horse and The $80 Champion. Just a couple bits more about that that are even more closely aligned with our world here. In 1954, uh, a 63-year-old Maine farmer, Annie Wilkins, embarked on an impossible journey. She had no money and no family. She had just lost her farm, and her doctor had given her only two years to live. But Annie wanted to see the Pacific Ocean before she died. She ignored her doctor's advice to move into the country, the county charity home. Instead, she bought a cast off brown gelding named Tarzan, donned men's dungarees and headed south in mid-November, hoping to beat the snow. Annie had little idea what to expect beyond her rural crossroads. She didn't even have a map, but she did have her racehorse, ex-racehorse, her faithful mutt, and her own unfailing belief that Americans would treat a stranger with kindness. The mutt's name, by the way, is Depeche Trois, which is so hilarious. Hurry along. Come on, come on, come on, let's go. Let's cross America. I hope you'll join me for the book. If you've not read it, and it was extremely popular, so I may simply be behind the time since i would not read it. Uh, but I hope you might join me for it. It is choice. Again, choices people make or choices people put off or choices people can't get around to making, et cetera, et cetera. And this was a determined choice of a main farmer at age, what did we say? 63. It's impossible. 63 in 1954. Please join me. Thank you again for being here today. I do hope that you were at least tantalized by the book. I think it's an unsung hero in the uh, wonderful collection of Mr. Hall. Uh, if you did enjoy the book, there is a little thumbs up icon there for you to press. There's also a share button if you'd like to send it on to somebody else. Um, there's also a place for comments uh, to write about your favorite Hawthorne book or experience with Hawthorne or, or some facts about Hawthorne. And maybe you've read the books of his connection to uh, Mr. Melville, which have been fascinating in the letters, um, or your favorite book. Uh, if you have a book in any genre whatsoever, uh, please suggest it to us. Send us a comment if you would. 
And there's also a place to subscribe. Subscribe normally uh, carries a price tag, not so here. Uh, book club, magazine club, wine club, no, no, no. Subscribing simply gives us your email so that we can send a monthly notice to you of what's coming up in the month. Um, and that's all it's all about. Uh, so if you do that, also, it would help us stay uh, in first place among all the public libraries in the state of Maine, small, medium, and large, uh, with the highest number of subscribers to our YouTube programs channel. We've been in that position for a year and a half. So we're quite happy. Um, some of the bigger libraries, however, are right on our tail. So we'd love to have you subscribe if you would. Thank you again. I hope you're enjoying the summer and I hope the rest of the summer is bringing to you some good memories. Take care of yourself and above all, stay healthy. Goodbye.